Mitchell Farrell, and I said it's in your packet. Um, I said we would hope the city council would consider options for a community to opt out of such a program so that presumably Hollywood could opt out of such a program. A one size fits all approach for street vending does not make sense. Um, I think that was the main thing I brought up at this point, and then I, uh, I, you know, raised a lot of questions about, you know, the devils and the details on these things. So what I would like to get out of the board today is, a, is an official position on this ordinance, and because um, we, we don't have one for the sunset bid, and the sunset bid can then uh, send a letter in. Um, it could kind of codify what I've already put here. Um, and you said right now your three positions are there should be an opt opt in opt in provision and enforcement. What was the third Compliance one? Compliance monitoring. Compliance the lights are out there. They're actually doing what they say they're going to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although, like, if, if we don't opt in, then I still don't really care about what the other communities you know, <laughs> they decide to um, take this on. So, um, what does the board think about having a formal position on this so we can be at the table? We totally agree. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Carrie, uh, one of the things that I think we should consider, and this was something that you mentioned, Mike, was the idea of having a certain percentage of the residents and the businesses. And the problem with the residents is that they don't deal with the things that the businesses do. So, they might say, wow, a bunch of great cheap food and cheap CDs, and they could vote it in, and then all the businesses are outloaded because there's a lot fewer businesses than there are mm -hmm. residences. So having the residents in on the opt-in seems like a bad idea. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that there's gonna be like a huge vending demand on like La Mirada Avenue, for example. Like how would the vendors make money and sustain there? But if they can get a toehold in an area, maybe then that gives them mobility to sunset. I, it, it's gonna be complicated, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we're so glad to have Rodriguez Strategies on board to kind of help us get a message about this. And, um, well, and I think the message first and foremost is this, these are ordinances is not acceptable that that's just a non-negotiable and that might be a place to start mm -hmm. and then see if you know once once it's time to negotiate you move forward with a suggestion or, or what might make you comfortable but mm -hmm. correct me if i'm wrong i think no, it's better right. to start from a place of yeah. their their legalization isn't right for la or it's not right for hollywood for or whatever hollywood. so is that the most helpful um, policy position to have i mean i think i think that the correct me if i'm wrong the board does the board imagine any condition under which you would want to see street vending in Hollywood? You do? Okay, so those like the New York model? Okay, so maybe premature to say, so this ordinance as it's presently constituted, um, the board cannot support, basically. And so, as it's constituted. As it's presently constituted. Okay. You know, the issue, too, is that the, the bus uh, issue, the, the uh, tour bus issue mm -hmm. is much bigger and yet it still isn't able to be regulated right. either. And they're a much bigger target. There's fewer of them. It takes a lot more to get Attractable. into it. And yeah. they are still not able to manage them. How are you going to manage a bunch of little carts? It just doesn't seem like it's possible. So are, are we going to make a uh, take a position on this? And uh, I, I would uh, go ahead and make a motion uh, that as uh, as our entity here, the Sunset Vine Bid, uh, oppose the uh, existing um, sidewalk vending ordinance as as because currently proposed as currently by proposed. by um, mm -hmm. Okay, and then you keep coming back if there are modifications made and you want to adjust your position over time. Okay. Second. So, Fred, all of, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Great. Thank you. I'll write the letter. And then the second thing is, and this may be premature, but I just I stuck it on the agenda um, just to uh, so you can be aware. Um, Central City Association is actually uh, paying for the um, services of. Uh, 
strategies to do the community mobilization. So they've taken on the full brunt of that cost to do the community mobilizing. Um, I, I don't think we need to deal with this today, but I want to just have it be on your radar that at some point, especially if this effort continues to pick up speed, you know, other bids may want to help um, help with the mobilization and maybe share in some of those costs. But for the most part, right now, if we're not for the Central City Association slash downtown bid taking on this responsibility, we have no organizing going on around this issue. And the other side is very well organized. Would somebody like to make a um, motion? I'm not really asking for a motion no. right now. That's <clears throat> what, what, what I would like to see for us to look at would be a cost analysis so that we can we can weigh in on it and review it and determine you know which which bids are interested in participating. So and also the chamber should yes, because absolutely. the chamber has small businesses as members and this might be a, a logical place for the chamber to get involved as well. Yeah, and just fashion district bid is supporting it and so is the um, Chinatown bid because they have major issues with spending. Yeah. Yeah. And Marie and uh, Mr. Gardner are coming to the Hollywood bid on Thursday as well. When you say supporting, they're against it. They're providing financial um, support. In favor of it? Um, in favor of the organizing strategy. Against no, against 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 That's what I thought you were saying, but I wanted to make sure because. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is there anything else that we can do to let our know, or is it too premature to do that? I know, you know as far as the property owners or even the, the, the businesses, they should. Yeah, so Jessica, that. that's a good point. We, we can help you with the organizing. Mm -hmm. And so um, these uh, petitions, obviously, if you send me the PDF, we can send them out. There's a lot of small businesses. I've been contacted by small mm -hmm. businesses who are very concerned about this. So I'll just make sure. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to deal with them directly? Yeah, I think if, if it's just a form like this, their name and address, and we can either go send a canvasser with a, a fact sheet and see if there's an anecdote to share or something more they'd be willing to do, but at the very least, just having a, a sheet with their name and signature on it is, is extremely helpful to us. Okay, yeah. I, I can even help give you some key people to talk to. And key people, yep, yeah. that would be great. That would be great, and we can go visit them during the day or at a time when it's not busy. Right. You yeah, know, we're looking to canvas when during a, the downtime in the business day. And then all of you can promote with your membership and stakeholder mm -hmm. groups try Please. To yeah and they can contact me directly Carrie, can, can you get to carry a, a, the fact sheet because obviously my yep. clients some of them being retail on the ground floor would be great just to send sure. it to them we'll plus the pdf of that mm -hmm. i don't know they're not based here the owners mm -hmm. and so i think it would be better just to get them the fact sheet and say hey mm -hmm. you should be aware of this and here's a mm -hmm. petition if you want more information call so and so that's how they, these guys operate they're not they don't have the time to sit down and just meet Mm -hmm. so busy with our fact sheet and talking points should be finalized within the next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can send that to the county to distribute. And I, who, who signed the petition that you want to give to? Um, Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Okay, so obviously there are things like farmers markets. There's like swap meet on Fairfax. Um, that people do. What about if it was a requirement that it had to be on private property? That somebody would set up a, let's say that I don't know, on a Saturday from for a three-hour window, that some, that 50 vendors could set up on private property, on a parking lot, uh, or something like that. I don't even know if it's legal or not. Is that right yeah. now legal? Yeah, I mean it'd be like having like a the taste of Hollywood yeah. here. Um, yeah. Festival. So on private property, it is legal. Mm -hmm. So Carrie, how did they fix the, uh, or has it been fixed the? Um, with that issue because we, we don't have the issue like we did before. Now I know they, they line up like crazy on Wilshire mm -hmm. Boulevard, you know, across from LACMA, mm -hmm. but I don't see them as often. As often. Did they just go out of business? I was kind of wondering, I was, I was thinking about that recently myself, and one, one of the theories I had 
was that food trucks have become very popular at like fundraisers and events where, or, or weddings, bar mitzvahs, you know, or, or just community gatherings where they otherwise would have had to bring in a caterer or whatever, and food trucks show up and it solves your food problem and then they leave. And, and maybe their business model has shifted in such a way that they they actually have there's a market for them in a controlled area and there's not as much need to park on the street. That's just a theory. I was wondering the same thing because nothing really has changed. You know what I mean? what I saw more and more is like where the car wash down the street from me at night that is a, a Mexican truck. They got people. They got chairs. They got okay. the table with the spices. If you go south on Vine, right before Santa Monica, the there's a gas station. pump, same thing. There's yeah. a truck, they got chairs, they got tables. So it's on private restaurant. property, though, no right? Private property. Yeah. So it's on private, private, private property. property. Yeah. Yes, it's a private property. But they're actually on more like quarter knows, though. Yeah. yeah. Who knows if the owner is aware of the property? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's also a website that sets up those trucks. To run. We have trucks that come every day, a different truck every day in the Bronx and Vine. And there's just there's this website. you. You go in yeah. and they, we sign them off and they come in and do food service. Yeah, that's kind There's of There's a whole system out there how it works. That's why you're, you're seeing them in the private places as opposed to on the street now. Yeah. But they come more for you, it's on the studios, it's, you know, it's private property, but, but you're allowed in. If you let them in, it's one thing, but. Yeah. They're, they're pretty much outside our school every day. Really? They know they got a market there with all their students. They'll pop out, quick, easy grab back in. I know they have to feed the meter so. Mm. Yeah, they always have. I feel like they didn't though for a while, and they got there was sort of a. Well, they did. There was a whole enforcement thing that was going yeah. on that was part of it because you're only allowed to feed the meter so long, right. and then they were moving to different meters, and they, they, their uh, LAPD got involved. In that, I know uh, George Abadad had a uh, big involvement in, in, in that. And, uh, and I, I think it got to a point with a lot of them where they just didn't want to be in a situation where they weren't wanted. Right. And this idea of calling them in to, to be on private property or in a location where they are well, feel welcome, that's a better situation for them. They still don't have grades. No. That's my problem. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, ultimately, it's still damaging to the stakeholders. Yeah. 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 yeah, ultimately, the stakeholders that have restaurant establishments, it's damaging to them. Yeah. You know, I think that's what we have to protect. Okay, so carrying 34 feet of midnight walk. Like Fabio. Um, this will just be a, a, a brief teaser, and we'll get back um, uh, photos next month. But uh, eight people went out on Saturday night from midnight to 3 a.m. Fabio was one of those folks. And we uh, divided up into two groups, and um, uh, one group took the subway down to Hollywood and Vine, and, and then we met in the middle because we wanted to see the 2 a.m. push at Hollywood and Las Palmas, which is the vortex of mayhem. <laughs> and um, uh, so I'm gathering photos. Everyone took cell phone photos of what they observed that night. Um, and we're going to do a presentation for the chamber and we'll bring those back to you as well. Um, I definitely will let Fabio share his impression. The, the one statement I will make is that I've done this <coughs> twice before. I did it once in 2012 in the fall and I did it in 2013 with the Hollywood Bid Board. Went out and did the midnight walk for the retreat. And things are better, so that's okay. encouraging. A lot of nightclubs have closed. Um, there didn't seem to be um, a, truly a gang presence out there like we noticed two years ago, which was really frightening. And um, uh, the LAPD just seems to be doing an extraordinary job of really kind of proactively controlling traffic and they actually shut down parts of Hollywood Boulevard so there's no cars driving and it just kind of reduces confusion. Um, uh, but they're definitely very, very busy <laughs> out there. And it's not, it's not, it's not what we want in the middle of the boulevard. Still, it's better on the edges, but the middle is still challenged. Fabio, what? what I have um, uh, Marty Sheldon. Read that. Yeah. Notes, yeah. and I think that if we you describe the, you know, yeah, I will add my observation through the lens of a tailor representative and a person concerned about social economic inequality. 
first representing retailer is a, it's still very scary. As I know, the trend in New York City is to stay open later in certain neighborhoods to obviously capture more consumer dollars. What I saw was not appealing at all. One, dirty sidewalks. Two, roll down doors. Three, homeless sleeping in doorways, the hardest problem to probably solve. Four, still a pretty rough crowd on the street. Five, the fact the LAPD had to set up a tactical plan makes the area look like an occupied state of emergency. And six, poorly light side street with uh, which access to park in the parking lot and garages. Second, the makeup of the patrons was decidedly minority, brown and black, and my guess from a lower economic strata. I am reading this that the Lindsay Lawn of the war are now hanging out at the Rusty Mullet. These bars, <laughs> nightclubs, are a cheap form of, uh, form of entertainment hanging out that attracts a lower level clientele, most likely from an out of area. I don't imagine a $50,000 per month apartment dweller from Sunset and Vine was at uh, James' house hanging with her homies. <laughs> that means to me, the bars are chatting people that will have very little respect for how our community looks when they leave. Uh, the guy I saw you in front of a McDonald's, Steve saw him, you're talking about somebody taking care of the store. Um, based on care assessment, I would agree that LAPD presence has made things better, but they wouldn't be needed in such force if there wasn't such a high concentration of Type 47 and 48 licenses targeted to the lowest denominators in our society. In closing, how is this night scene going to mesh with the new high income residents coming in along with OSC tenant? Along with oh. who? With OFC tenants. OFC yeah. office tenants. Yeah. Office, 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 office tenants, tenants. Yeah. yeah. So I thought it was better, but it's still mm -hmm. not good. It is kind of like you see all this closing in the cars in the middle. And then all of a sudden, some, something happened. All the cars, woo, woo, woo. Yeah, but he was it. like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Well, we're on top of the roof of the building, so we have no problem. But, you know, looking at this, it was a little. You know, one of the problems I think, and this is from going to the security meetings, I think that the patrons do have a lot of money. And they, that's why they cater to them. And that's why some of the nightclubs don't want to get rid of these kind of people because they do have a ton of money and they pay a lot of money for the drink, for, for, no, for getting into the building. It's not so much the drinks because they do other things instead because after hours it's mayhem. But, um, but whatever they look like, they have money from somewhere and they're bringing it to these <coughs> businesses who don't really care about anything except that they think One about. thing that I was surprised is that uh, that corner, uh, La Fonda de Hollywood, has no cameras. Yeah, they need to camera. It's ground zero for activity there and, and they were talking about putting on Bronson and Hollywood I don't think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. That's where you want to have it. Okay. Okay. Going off what Carol said, um, I think there's an important distinction to make too. Between, it doesn't really matter how much money they have or what status they come from. If they want to put money into our community, it's a good thing. Now, I'm not endorsing the way they're doing that. I think that is an issue, a huge issue. Um, but I don't think that we should be, especially public facing, going out with the distinction of we don't want lower economic status is coming and visiting Hollywood. If people want to visit Hollywood and go out to eat or catch a movie or go to the plantations. I'm all for that. Um, I, but I think that's kind of a slippery slope to start doing things that way. Yeah, I agree with Chase. Um, you know, the $64,000 question in is this, why is Los Angeles one of the only cities that has nightlife that has a curfew at 2 a.m.? It just seems like it creates, I know there's, this has been a discussion for a long time, but it just creates this huge problem of dumping all these people out on the street at the same time. And uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. They, you know, the, New York, Las Vegas, Chicago, Boston, they've got a lot more clubs 
it's not the number of clubs, it's not the number of 47s or 48s, it's, it's just dumping all these people out onto the street at 2 a.m. that's causing a huge problem. I don't know, it just seems counterproductive to me. It was beautiful to see the Hollywood Boulevard, no cars. It was like uh, those streets in, in Italy that you walk and there's no cars. And, and I was envisioning what you see. You were talking about tables outside the restaurant. It would have, it was very nice, very inspiring. But it's not going to happen. Nice. So we'll bring the photos back next month and maybe to be a little bit more time. And by that time, the chamber, I know the chamber is going to be talking about this at the retreat um, as well. So um, really glad that the people took made the time to do that. It's really important for the business community to see what happens um, when everybody else is asleep. Um, 47 and 48 license, is that like a license like for after hours, like 2 uh, a.m. to? 47 a full bar. 48, you don't, yeah. you're not supposed no to serve any food. 47, you're still supposed to serve food. 48 is just straight a bar. bar. Straight bar. Ball dancing and all that. <laughs> then you can fit that's for the and ends at two. Yeah. Okay. Well, they can stay open till four, but they're not selling uh, alcohol. Alcohol. So they know, everybody so needs to be closed. They're not interested yeah. in having breakfast. Um, <laughs> but forty-seven, they need to serve uh, food, food, and then it'll come in the terms of condition. The problem. Uh, it's not that we don't have rules. Uh, the problem is the enforcement. Mm -hmm. There's no fire department checking on, you know, uh, occupancy. Occupancy. The occupancy. There's no ABC checking if they serve a <coughs> minor or, you know, they have all their alcohol purchase. Legit. I don't know. They don't. There's nobody around. Just the police. Right. Police, they, 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 they carry a big burden to me. And they know it. And, they, and we, we talk about it. And they say, well, there's nobody else. Just us. Fire department, no health department, no health department. You're gonna come to my restaurant to find an inspector. That's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. New business. Before we go into new business, Joe, did you were you gonna hand these out? These infographics? Yes, yeah, sir. They're supposed to get handed out at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do that real quick, and then I'll, I'll go through this, and then you can describe our. Procedure and how do you get more? How yeah. do you get sent because I don't want your phone? What is it? Um, you mean, that must be your phone. No. Lotto ticket. Thank you. Did you want me to describe that now? You said Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Sure. So we just uh, we presented this a couple months ago. These are our infographics. They are now printed and out. Um, this was primarily a project of the Hollywood bid, which is why they went out to Hollywood stakeholders. Um, but we wanted to share this with the Sunset and Mine District because it does. In, Compass uh, your district, many of the facts and the figures there, and um, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from these. You know, they were featured on Curved LA um, two months ago, and um, everybody who's received them in the mail seems to be very happy with them. So, on that note, we've also received uh, requests for additional copies uh, to give to prospective uh, investors, or stakeholders, or tenants, and so we are uh, toying with the option of printing additional copies. Um, they run about four dollars for a set of ten. That's with the envelope and the sticker and kind of the packaging all put together is what the, the printer quoted us. So it's uh, four dollars per set. But if you're interested in, in some, like I said, from, you can include it in perspective. You know, packets or, or tenant pitches. Uh, let us know, and we're trying to put together an order list um, within the next week or two so we can get that together, and then we'll have some available in the office for purchase. So if you're interested, let me know. If you're not. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Um, the uh, last month, I mentioned that we were, um, I was going to bring back a bylaws amendment to you. So I, there's a little uh, handout here. Um, if you recall, we kind of came to the conclusion that taking half the board, two year terms, half the board goes off the board, or so terms expire every other year. And it kind of creates a burden for the nominating committee to um, process through eight or seven candidates every two years. So we opted to move toward the notion of having um, three-year terms, so staggered three-year terms. So you basically have one-third of your board coming, one-third there, one-third going. But the way to, to achieve that is um, 
that we would uh, approve this bylaws amendment, which I'll read to you, and then if it passes, I actually have uh, little lots that you will pick today, and we will reassign your terms. If you look on the back of this um, uh, bylaws amendment, have everybody listed on the board with the, their, their term will expire in February by the 2016. We'll redraw lots, we'll re reassign you, and then those of you who uh, expire in 2016 will apply for a three year term. Okay? So the terms of office will be changed to say the directors shall be divided into three classes, nearly equal in number. At the March 2015 meeting of the Board of Directors, lots will be drawn to assign terms ending in February 2016, five seats, February 2017, five seats, and February 2018, five seats. Commencing with the annual meeting of the Board of Directors held in 2016, and at each succeeding annual meeting of the Board of Directors, successors to the class of directors whose terms expire at such annual meetings shall be elected for a three-year term. And that will be the go forward strategy. So, um, would somebody like to make? I would like to. Oh, okay. Chase has made a motion. Second. Charles? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Yes, thank you. All right, this is the fun part. And it's amazing because everybody's here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, pick one, and then this will be the master. So, I'll pass this around and go ahead and put an X next to your name for where you end up. So, okay. <laughs> oh, this is fun. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got this one forever. <laughs> <laughs> So you can pass that around, Brian, and start to put your X on oh, okay. the other. Thank you. They won't be you know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you guys. We only want it. Sure. <laughs> Do you know why it's a 2018? I was I was supposed to turn off this year. Not me. And then Fred, are there? Oh no, that's Mister Green. Very very bad. Considering I've been on this board since 2003. Oh, I was the same. That's right. Oh, I think she's there. Oh, there. So not for me to choose. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Car. Yeah, I'll sign them off. Back next month. Um, there's a, a resurrection of a bill that was um, introduced about two years ago. I think it was 85 at that time, uh, which is a pretty uh, punitive bill called the Homeless Bill of Rights. Um, which. Which, among other things, um, would have made it impossible for um, <laughs> for members of the of, uh, of the public or the bid patrol or others to actually be in a position to help encourage people to move off the streets. It was a broad-ranging um, bill that created a a lot of confusion. It was poorly written, and it was ultimately defeated. And it has come back in a different form, a shortened form now. Um, it's actually now, I think, called the, the uh, Right to Rest, the Right to Rest Act. And um, we just heard about it last week, coming out of the CBA uh, conference. So um, I think we'll come back at the next meeting with a recommendation to you on um, a potential new position on this bill. It's in the pipeline. So we have lots of staff reports. Um, 
end, I'm, you know, I've been keeping you informed about Adrian Riskin's request for um, documents from our office. We are working on um, submitting to him as soon as he gets me a hard drive or a USB flash drive. Um, all of the photos uh, will be coming to you, Adrian, for the year 2007 from um, Andrew's security, so we were able to get that to you. Uh, we have a lot more in the pipeline that Adrian has requested, but we are doing our best in the midst of everything that we've got going on in the office to try to respond to his request. Um, so nothing new has come in, um, but this is, we've got a lot of work ahead of us to um, uh, try to um, come up with the information that he is asking from us. Um, the Promise Zone, we were supposed to have Dixon Slingerland here today. He's the um, executive director of the Youth Policy Institute. He, this is the group that has, you know, kind of been instrumental in having this area declared a promised neighborhood and a promised zone. Um, he's going to come to the next meeting. But I know Joe was actually at a meeting today. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that you want to report to the board on recent Yeah, just um, to, it, <clears throat> it's kind of a confusing um, piece of, it's not really legislation, but just a piece of, of uh, whatever it is. <laughs> but um, So the Promise Zone was enacted last year. Uh, it's a tenure uh, designation for Hollywood. And within the Promise Zone, what happens is, is that the Mayor's Office, the Economic Development Department of the Mayor's Office is um, overseeing it. So Allison Becker is overseeing the Promise Zone and they've partnered with the Youth Policy Institute to kind of implement the programs within the Promise Zone. Um, <coughs> there's, there's three programs. Uh, one is the Burn Justice Center grant, which is uh, it's a grant related to areas of, within the Promise Zone and also Pacoima. And it's specifically looked at um, looking at trying to combat part one crimes and reduce them. Um, so these, these funds are available for basically programs that would help to reduce part one crimes in those areas. Um, the other is, which is I think the one that is probably most uh, relevant to us and what we do, and this is the meeting that was at today, is what's called the Choice Neighborhood Grant. And what that is, is that that is a program through HUD, uh, the Housing and Urban Development Department of the federal government. And it's a 30 million grant. Uh, what has happened is that YPI is, is partnered with an affordable housing developer to create a planning report for that. Um, as many of you may recall, back in February, I, I emailed you asking that you would please attend a design charrette that they had put on. Uh, Tori Gauss is the architect. It was on February 12th, and it was up at the Los Palmas Senior Center. Uh, Matthew and myself actually went to it, uh, and I will say I was, I was rather disappointed. There was a uh, dismal, if any, showing from the business community. It was uh, primarily the seniors who lived in that building that showed up to it, and um, some of the other seniors living in the surrounding area. So. Um, needless to say, when I went today, uh, basically today's meeting was the second to last meeting of, the, of this plan that needs to be submitted to HUD. And so the first draft is due July 1st, and the final draft is due November 1st. So um, the first draft they are preparing for, and so they had a report back from this charrette that we went to, and as expected, the results were very skewed um, towards this, the senior demographic and, and what they had shared with the, the architect. So under the direction of, of Allison Becker, who is there today, they're, they're gonna go back and try to get more data for the community. I suggested that um, maybe we try to put together something with both boards and have them present their their kind of initial study to um, to what they're finding and also get your input as, as business uh, leaders and owners in this community. And the reason why this is important is it's, it's potentially $30 million that we would know by March of next year to come into this community. And what HUD is doing now is that these funds are being used to develop affordable housing, but it's not just as HUD would do in the past where they'd say, here's $30 million, go build an apartment building and make it, you know, 25 to 75% AMI or whatever it is. Now what HUD's doing is saying, here, build the housing piece, but I also want you to build a community piece to help incorporate that community and, and, and sustain it and make it better. So they're actually looking at everything that we're talking about. They're looking at mobility, they're looking at walking, access to groceries, sidewalks, Everything that we're kind of looking at would be encompassed within this grant and they would try to touch a piece of that. So out of the proposal that they had, um, and like I said, it was is very heavily kind of tilted towards the data that they got from this. They were looking at maybe doing um, a, a shared space concept for Hudson, which um, had been looked at as a pocket park in the past. They're trying to think of something maybe for that. And then also doing a Yucca Street 
uh, Yucca Street Improvement Project from Wilcox to Coenga. So um, there was concerns with that because the choice neighborhood, it's, it's a weird boundary. It encompasses, I can pass this around, it's very hard to see, but it encompasses a small portion of our Hollywood bid and, and actually a fairly sizable portion of the Sunset bid because it goes all the way down to Santa Monica, Long Vine. So it's more your district that's actually within this boundary. And um, what, what they're looking at doing is, is two housing sites. One would be a, re, uh, a renovation of the Los Palmas Senior Center and the other would be a ground up affordable housing development. And then those two additional projects that I looked at. Some of the feedback that came from the group today was that um, those projects were mostly in the northeastern portion of this boundary and they're not really considering the southeastern portion. So they're gonna go back and maybe see if there's something more scalable or, or pedestrian oriented that they can do in that area because it's also an area in need of some attention. But um, we have no say in this other than just giving our input. We, we don't have a sign off on it. We're not getting any money from it. We're not uh, really directly benefiting from it, but it's just important that I think we get to the table and provide our feedback because like I said, it's $30 million. It's a lot of money. And I know we would all love to see more affordable housing built here and to have a community and mobility component that comes along with that money I think is something that it's almost like just a gift in our lap if we can get to the table and kind of give some insight on how they should use that. What's an example of the skewed findings they have because of the well, people have been participating? They, they found that they had really high transit use. Uh, the LADOT dash is like, they made it sound like it was the number one bus. The used. dash? LADOT dash, oh, the dash bus. <laughs> was the I've number, never seen anybody on that. It was like the number one, they were like, this is the greatest bus on the planet. We need to find more access to the to the dash route. Um, <coughs> there was no, no findings to metro buses or really the subway being used. Um, they said that there wasn't proper access to groceries, which we have a lot of great markets in the area and our own farmer's market. So, and there's very few people who reported that they ever went to the farmer's market. Um, some things were in line with what we found already. Hollywood's dirty, They're, they got that feedback. Sidewalks are not good. Um, they felt that Coenga was more the local serving, neighborhood serving portion of the district. Um, one thing that was interesting, and, and this is something that we talked about on the Hollywood board a lot, is looking at the mid bid, and they didn't call it that, but the mid bid area and trying to see how they could uh, cater to more neighborhood serving uses in that section of the boulevard for a lot of the uh, residential community that's there. And then just traffic and parking. But um, they just, they had a lot of, a lot of the data was looking at more that north northeastern corridor and that People said that they don't walk Hollywood Boulevard, they never use Hollywood Boulevard. Um, it, it was just kind of a little bit skewed and they don't go out at night. Um, so there was really no nighttime data for them to collect. So there's there's a whole, there's millennials missing from this piece. There's, you know, families missing from this piece. It's it's just, they're, they're basing this, this plan, which is what will ultimately determine if we get this $30 million or not, or not we, but they, um, on the promise zone on you know, basically one demographic set of data. So we need to get to the table, we need to get other groups to the ta table. I, I'm glad Allison brought that up and I think they're gonna kind of push for that. And then the other thing just to note about the Promise Zone is, um, and I, I'm sure maybe many of you know this already, but just I've gotten questions about this. There was kind of a, a, a sense that when we got the Promise Zone that we were gonna get all this money here. There's, there's no money that comes with the Promise Zone. It is strictly just a designation. Basically what it is, is it gives us like kind of bonus points. It's like when you play golf, it's a handicap basically that allows you when you submit for grants to kind of get bumped up to the top for consideration because your grant is within that promise zone area. So um, that's kind of the Reader's Digest version of what it is. It's very complicated. There's a whole nother program that Kitty's aware of that works with education in the community and that's a whole different grant than the other two that I just mentioned. But I, I almost feel like I'm getting another master's going to these meetings because there's there's so much to learn and and I'm only I think just scratched the surface. So I'm just gonna try to keep you informed the best I can. And then like I said, I'm gonna work with them because I really do think it'd be it would benefit us to have a, even a separate meeting with the architect and just kind of give our own charrette and just get your input and sense on what what you what you think Hollywood needs with that thirty million or what can be done. Thank you for tracking those meetings. Yeah. Are you going to take the IDA conference? Yeah, the IDA conference. So we just went to the California Downtown Association. That's our um, state organization here, trade organization for bids. Um, we had it in Santa Monica. It was a great conference. Um, we'll probably be reporting next month on the top 10 things that we learned 
all four of us here on staff went, and thank you to Ginny for holding down the fort in the office. Um, so we'll have some things to report back, but we have our annual IDA, which is the International Conference, and this year it's, it's fairly local, it's actually in San Francisco. Um, and we always encourage board members if they like to go, to go. It's a great conference. It's a really, not just is it a good time to go to these sessions, but it's a really great time to network with other bids across, not just this country, but it, uh, literally the world. I met people from South Africa when I was there a couple years ago in Europe. Um, and it's just neat to see how what we do is done in other parts of the country. Uh, what are some of the kind of groundbreaking trends that are starting to arise? And I think it's really good for board members to kind of see too, just what other bids and what other towns and cities are doing. Um, so we have information on it. Um, the dates are here at September 30th through October 2nd. If you're interested in going, let us know. Maybe we can find a way to caravan up there. I don't know. I don't. I don't know how many staff are going yet. We haven't decided that. But it's. I would just encourage any board member who can spare the time to go up there. And who doesn't like San Francisco? So, you know. Thank you, Jim. Yep. All right. Our next meeting is April 14th. So please put it on your. Calendars. And if there's nothing else, we will adjourn.